Thank you very much, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone who's watching us through the internet uh, superhighway, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on what time zone you live in. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the um, Ministry of uh, National Guard, the Health Affairs, uh, for organizing such an amazing summit. I feel uh, honored and at the same time humbled to be chosen to discuss or to speak at this summit. The title of uh, my presentation is The Role of AI in Fighting Current and Future Pandemics. Uh, the presentation, I'll have uh, four parts. I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, then we'll highlight some of the areas where AI played a role in combating COVID-19. Uh, and then we will look at what the future look like when it comes to AI, or how can we unlock the potential of uh, AI for future uh, epidemics or pandemics. And finally, we'll look at some of the challenges uh, that hinder uh, realizing the full potential of AI. So when we mention AI, we always think of it as an exotic term. You know, it's, see, people think AI, they think about sci-fi movies. They don't think it's a reality or something that we experience and we live today. I wanna to just give some two examples. 6,000 miles away and nine days before the World Health Organization even mentioned COVID-19, AI was able to detect and flag the existence of COVID-19. So we have a company called Blue Dot, it's located in Canada. And also there was a um, um, uh, health map, which is in Boston. They made the similar observation. They noticed an increase in the number of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. And that was abnormal activity for them. The AI algorithm detected it and flagged it as an abnormal activity. Have we had looked at it, we would have had nine days head start with AI. So fighting pandemics, we you know, raise the hat for our heroes, our health staff, health professionals who risks their lives and spare their times just to you know, make people feel better and help people in such difficult times. However, in the back end, we have other people who help those heroes. We have authorities, we have medical researchers, data scientists, statisticians, who develop and use technology and AI to facilitate and improve and help the health and the health professionals do their job in a proper and effective way. They say that if you want to predict the future, you should look at the past. Just looking back two decades ago in this century, we have had nine epidemics and pandemics. Uh, in 2009, we have H1N1. And in 2020, we have COVID-19. I show this slide just to say, um, to show that, you know, when we talk about COVID-19, we should not talk about it in isolation. We should look at it as something that we learn from, but this is a sad reality that we may have something similar uh, in the future. And it's very important when you talk about pandemics that we don't need to deal with them in isolation. We don't need to deal with each one of them in a separate way. So we're talking in this presentation, I'll give some examples and some ideas how AI helps with COVID-19. However, we should not lose focus. We should, when we look for a solution, we should develop a holistic approach. We should develop something that could help us with any kind of pandemics. So looking at the current pandemic, the COVID-19, how did AI help? I categorize that under five major categories. So we have prediction models, we have contact tracing, we have medicine development, patient care, diagnostics and examinations. And I'll explain each of them and then I'll show some of the examples and there are many examples around the world. When it comes to prediction models, we need to develop those models to help decision-making processes. 
So the governments and decision makers, they need to make important decisions and timely decisions in these pandemics. And those decisions depend on what's gonna happen. If you don't have an accurate and effective prediction models, then you cannot make such decisions. And if you have poor models, then you'll make poor decisions. I'm talking about, for example, how to allocate health professionals, how to distribute resources, talking about logistics and so on. When it comes to contact tracing, this is a very important factor when it comes to dealing with pandemics, pandemics by nature spread through people by being in touch or in contact with each other. So to, to be able to effectively manage those pandemics, you need to understand and to manage effectively the contact between people. And this is where contact tracing comes into place. You need to understand who is what, who and then how, and to be able to effectively limit unneeded uh, interactions. When it comes to medicine development, of course, I'm holding my breath. Everyone else is holding their breath. We're waiting for the news that, you know, an effective vaccine is being developed. AI plays a huge role in the development of such vaccines. Patients, patient care, of course, by nature, pandemics, you have a lot of people who are in need of medical help. And if to do that effectively, you must rely on technology. And AI and technology play a huge role in that. And I'll show some examples. And finally, diagnostics and examination. Of course, this is also an important factor. It will help contain pandemics. If you are able to detect people or potential uh, patients, and by that eliminating further patients uh, with the, uh, viruses. So for the predictions models, for example, in Saudi Arabia, we have developed what we call COVID-19 index. So this model basically outlines how is this virus is going to spread, uh, in which areas, uh, and uh, how and the amount of a number of people who will be infected. Of course, this is uh, a model that, uh, you know, utilizes uh, statistics and AI to help decision makers to develop and make these important decisions. For example, we would like to understand how many people will need medical help in that area. How many health professionals should I allocate? How many kinds of medicines that I need to buy for this amount of time? You cannot wait for things to happen and then make decisions. You need to be proactive in a sense. So to do the proper planning, you need to have a proper and effective prediction model. Of course, we're not the only ones who are doing it. Like for example, the United States, um, they developed such a, a model and they anticipated what is going to happen if you do not quarantine people or if you do not have curfews. And they, ha they plotted different scenarios and they got different results for different scenarios. And based on those numbers, decision makers are able to uh, do some uh, evident, evidence-based decisions. When it comes to contact tracing, of course, this is a very important factor. We always hear uh, the term flatten the curve. Um, during this pandemic. This happens by eliminating the spread of the virus and eliminating the spread of the virus always goes back to the contact tracing. What we have noticed that, you know, countries that were effective in controlling the spread of the virus relied heavily on technology. In Saudi Arabia, we developed uh, the two apps. One is called Tawakanna, uh, which basically made people's lives easier during such difficult times. It was managed to help people obtain permissions during curfew times. It was uh, provided some information about uh, the, the uh, uh, some information related uh, to health and health care. Uh, we also developed an app called Tabaud, which relies on Apple's and Google's exposure notification APIs and, uh, you know, among other countries. So that app will allow you, once you download it, to be able to know when you have been in close contact with someone who was infected. So the way it works, the app utilizes the Bluetooth in the phone to detect when you are in close contact with a person and how long the exposure was. And based on that, if someone gets infected, you will be notified that you have been exposed to a person who was infected. Of course, the app was developed, uh, taking into account the uh, privacy of the users. Of course, other countries developed similar applications. For example, in the United States, we have COVID Watch. When it comes to medicine development, again, we're waiting for the good news any time of the day right now. I believe yesterday, Russia, they announced that they have developed a vaccine. I believe there is work also in Harvard, uh, human 
in the, uh, immune economics initiatives and also in benevolent AI and other countries as well, they're working on developing the vaccine. The life cycle of the development of the vaccine usually is long. And we believe that you know technology and AI could cut this life cycle short uh, by obtaining better results, by providing better analysis uh, for the prospective uh, vaccines. When it comes to patient care, again, you know, with pandemics, uh, and I, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the health professionals, they risk their lives every day by providing help for people who need it. So we would like to use technology to make their jobs easier. And we believe that technology played a huge role in patient care, whether in the context of COVID-19 or in general. Uh, for example, in, uh, in the United States, uh, Emerald uh, developed and used uh, Internet of Things to enable health professionals to get the information from the patients without being physically there. Uh, so you get the vitals, you get the movement and so on of the patients and you are able to monitor them without being exposed to the, any health risks that relate to that. Also in the United Kingdom, um, they developed a way that they could uh, diagnose emerging coronavirus patients through X-rays. And for diagnostics and examination, again, this is a very important uh, issue when it comes to dealing with pandemics. You need to uh, screen and to discover potential um, patients. Uh, in the United States, they, do, uh, they are working uh, on something called Cough Against COVID. Basically, what it does, it's utilizing AI technologies to discover the potential COVID-19 patients through the sound of their coughs. So applying machine learning uh, to different sounds of coughs and then developing a way to be able to judge, you know, based on the sound of the cough, whether that person is going to be a COVID-19 patient or not. Uh, also in China, they developed a, a remote diagnostics where they have cameras with heat sensors. And when someone passes, uh, that camera will analyze uh, the, 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 the heat signature of that person and it, it, and it uses uh, AI to, um, with an accuracy of 0 0.3 degree to be able to flag if that person is a potential COVID-19 patient or not. So these are the different areas. Uh, our team at SDIA, they, um, they did a small analysis and they wanted to see how effective AI in the current pandemic. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, and I believe that you know our audience and, and their uh, survey in the survey just before this lecture, I think they hit the nail on the head uh, in their uh, estimations or in their uh, you know guess of how effective AI is. We have five areas. In some areas, we notice that AI is doing a good job, but in some other areas, we believe there is a huge room for improvement. Again, even if the percentage is 80% or 70%, this is a high percentage. However, we hope in the future that this percentage is going to be much, much, much higher. When it comes to prediction, of course, there is an issue of lack of proper and uh, good quality data. So the prediction models, they provide you with some insights. However, they are not as accurate as we wish. And sometimes they are affected by the short period of time that this uh, virus uh, has been there. Uh, when it comes to contact tracing, technology could play a huge role. However, we face some difficulties when it comes to legislations or sometimes with the collaboration of people, you know, using that technology. So technology is there. However, if you don't use it, then it's not going to be effective. Uh, medicine development, we believe there's a huge potential in that. However, it's not um, technology reliant as it is uh, for other fields and other disciplines. Patient care and diagnostics and examination, the percentage is up there. Uh, however, we're hoping in the near future that this percentage will go much higher. So as I mentioned, AI is doing and helping um, you know, us fight the pandemic. However, we're not realizing the full potential of AI. There are two main reasons, and I'm gonna explain that also in, in the next slides. The first reason is that we're being reactive and not proactive. And, you know, just to put it in simple words, being reactive, basically, when the pandemic happens, that's when we decide to deal with it. And that's when we decide to act upon it. But have we had something similar or even better than the example of blue dot? 
then we'll be able to spot the pandemics even before they become pandemics and deal with them accordingly. And the second issue is that the, the efforts in dealing with those pandemics are not complementary. And I mean by that is that everyone is trying to do their best. However, they're working in silos. The bit, one of the largest issues, and I'm gonna talk about them in the few, next few slides, is the issue of data sets that are incomplete. Imagine if we had everyone collaborating and sharing data sets with that will have a better and a data set that is complete and with a good quality. Imagine what would AI algorithms do with that. So for the future, you know, learning from the past, we believe that in the future we could improve and we could capitalize more and unlock the full potential of AI if we do three things. First of all, we need to be proactive. And by that, I mean digital surveillance. We need to be able to have systems that are always looking for abnormalities, always looking for different patterns that will be the initial uh, spark of, of a pandemic. The second thing is utilizing the technology in the contact tracing. We believe that technology could play a huge role in eliminating the spread of the virus if applied properly. Right now, technology is so cheap. The cell phone that I have in my pocket is more powerful than the computer I had probably 10 years ago. And the technology is advancing so fast. Sensors are getting cheaper and smaller and more effective. If we use that, we'll have more data to feed in our systems and more data to enable us to control and limit the spread of the viruses. And also, if we do the two things, then health professionals, the organizations, the governments will have more time, more resources, more budgets to allocate for the vaccine development. And with that, we can cut the life cycle of developing vaccines a lot shorter. And we will also have more data to feed into the, the uh, development of the, vac of the vaccines. So this is what it's gonna look like. So this is the optimistic, what the future looks like basically if we had, and God forbid we hope that we don't have any future pandemics, but you know, for the reality is that this is you know, something that's probably gonna happen. So what's gonna happen is that you need to have an always on digital surveillance. You need to have systems that monitors the data from different hospitals around the world and labs, and to be able to spot if there is uh, an abnormality or something that is out of the ordinary. And that's where the gray dot on the left is. That's when you have the initial rise of the number of cases. That's when you understand that you are facing something that is new, something that you need to watch out for. Once that happens, then immediately you need to apply what you have with the contact tracing and isolation. You need to apply those technologies and then you need to enable automatic sample collections. Those two things, first of all, will allow you to prevent the spread by eliminating the future or potential uh, patients. And it will also allow you to obtain and collect more data that you will utilize in the prediction models as well in the development of the vaccine. So with that, with that continuous effort, with the more data, more data that you get, the vaccine development will life cycle will be cut shorter until Hopefully we get to that green dot. That's when you have an effective uh, and working vaccine. And that's when you basically uh, deploy that vaccine and then the chart and the number will go uh, lower until we have zero cases. If you notice something in that optimistic future uh, prediction is that the curve is almost flat. It's increasing, but it's not exponentially increasing. And that, I believe, is the proper way, and that is the effective way of dealing with the pandemics. Once you control the number of patients, where you control the, the, the spread of those, whether viruses or whatever they are, uh, to a minimum number, and then deal with them in a shorter period of time. So that was a glimpse on you know, what we have done currently and what AI is doing currently and what it would look like in the future. However, you know, I don't want to paint a very optimistic picture. We do have some challenges and those challenges could limit uh, us utilizing and capitalizing on AI. The first one is the processing capability. Let's face it, as I mentioned before, technology is advancing 
faster than ever. We have faster uh, processing capabilities, but they are not as fast as we would hope. Um, AI and data, they go hand in hand. Usually when we discuss or talk about AI, we're talking about processing a very large amount of data, big data. And that's where AI excels because it could spot patterns that human, uh, the human eye could not spot. So the processing capabilities what used to take months before, right now takes weeks or maybe days. However, we hope that it would take maybe hours or less so that we could, uh, we could conduct more experiments in a very short period of time and deal with uh, pandemics in a much uh, faster way. The other part is data, and that's a twofold. So data, you have the issue of uh, incompleteness and you have the issue of quality. The issue of incompleteness is that, you know, as I mentioned before, different government, different organizations, they work in silos. So you have a set of data, however, that set of data is not complete. If we have proper data sharing, if we have a proper uh, collaboration where the, the, uh, the uh, amount of data increases and the quality of data increases, th those kind of data, when you feed it into AI algorithms, that's when you get the better results. If you have bad data and you feed it into AI algorithms, the results uh, are guaranteed uh, to be inefficient. And if you have incomplete data and you feed it into the algorithms, the decision or the results or the insights are going to be incomplete. And the third part or the third challenge is the interventions. Again, AI is an emerging technology. When we talk about emerging technologies, they have one thing in common, and is that is they advance so fast that legislations and policy making cannot keep up with them. So when we discuss AI, we hear t terms like ethical AI, trustworthy AI. We have issues with AI that we did not anticipate. I can give you examples so they could apply them in health field or other fields. But we have cases, for example, with self-driving cars. So a self-driving car is driving on the road and it gets an accident. So who is to blame? Is it the car company? Is it the software company? Is it the developer himself? Is it the source of the data that used to train the AI algorithm? Or is it the driver? So these issues, the liability is, is an issue right now. And people, because AI is advancing so fast in a very short period of time, they are still exploring what, how to deal with it. The same thing if you can apply it in health field. What if an AI algorithm provided you with a diagnosis that was inaccurate? So who is to blame? Is it the doctor? Is it the AI? Is it the software company? And so on. And that's why it's important for policymakers to enable and help develop policies that will enable the AI algorithms or the AI as a technology to advance in a very safe way that's why in Saudi Arabia, in the Digital Economy Task Force, one of the issues, or one of the major issues that we talked about is trustworthy AI. How can you utilize, how can you apply and deploy AI in a trustworthy manner, preserving privacy and preserving all other issues that are related to that. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the end of my presentation. I hope I was able to provide some insights about how AI could help in the current and the future pandemics. Thank you very much.